بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله احد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا احد say he is allah who is one allah the eternal refuge he neither begets nor is born nor is there to him any equivalent sadaq allah lazim rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wahlul uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli alhamdulillah salatu was salam ala rasuli nabiyil karim wa ala alihi ashabihi ajmain amma ba those who are joining now i welcome you all and we are still waiting for a few of us joining so that we can start our session alhamdulillah with allah's blessing we have a great number of registration over 320 participants joining today and i'm very glad to welcome all of you a brief introduction to taif Taif Digital Institute is created to lead the way through a new age approach of training and awareness of Islamic finance. Taif is providing an end-to-end -end digital learning solution for Islamic banks and Islamic finance institutions by combining the knowledge of Islamic finance and technology and presenting it to the masses of the ummah. Taif offers to make Islamic banking and finance to the world as a commercially viable solution by digitizing it and making it available to all i can see many of your names who have been joining our webinar for the last one year and i'm glad to see your names again we have many of you from different part of the world thank you very much for joining In today's session, we will be having Mufti Ismail Desai. Mufti Ismail is a Sharia advisor at Taif. He is an internationally reputed Sharia advisor and investment banker who currently serves a special advisor to various Islamic finance institutions, Islamic banks, investment entities. an educational institute around the world of the smile has developed various sharia auditing governance and risk management standards for islamic financial institutions and has issued several thousand expert legal opinions fatwas with a special focus on islamic finance and economics of the smile has attended and delivered papers and international conferences and has created the first ever sharia compliant model for leverage structured finance and currency trading alhamdulillah thank you very much uh, for everyone waiting uh, sheikh is with us and then as i mentioned before uh, about sheikh and today's sheikh will be delivering on the topic of islamic finance development in 2020 and opportunities post covid 19 you will get to know about the current state of islamic finance Sheikh will be highlighting the developments that have happened in the past years and uncovering the opportunities for all of you. I believe all of us are a part of Islamic finance industry who are gathered here, and all of us are upcoming leaders. So Sheikh will be giving you a lot of information about what you can discover in this coming year, which is being delivered by 2020 in the post-COVID. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The mic is yours, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Respected brother. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli wa nusallimu ala rasulihi al-kareem. Amma ba'd. Respected management of Taif Digital Institute. Brothers and sisters in Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would firstly like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude and shukriya to all of you including the esteemed management of Taif Digital Institute for extending this invitation in terms of developments and opportunities 
in Islamic finance. Today's discourse will entail a brief lecture on the key developments and opportunities for Islamic finance. And thereafter, we will conduct a brief question and answer session for any questions that you may have. Without further ado, I would like to begin the first part of today's webinar with a brief discourse on Islamic finance developments and opportunities post the COVID-19 pandemic. Islamic finance in 2019 had achieved a growth rate of approximately 14.9% in 2019 with Sukuk issuance of more than 160 billion US dollars. In previous years, Islamic finance had achieved single digit growth and in 2019, it had achieved a double digit growth for the first time. Obviously with 2020 and the COVID-19 pandemic, this has created a huge challenge for Islamic financial institutions globally. The lockdown measures had an impact on Islamic financial in institutions in terms of their profitability. And we had expected and outlined previously that for 2020, we would expect to see single digit growth. Mm -hmm. However, what we did find was that towards the second half of 2020, that Sukuk issuance had picked up and we had seen strong growth for Islamic finance in the second half of 2020. The second factor that negatively impacted Islamic finance was the oil, oil price war that was initiated by Saudi Arabia and, and Russia. And the oil price had an impact on the markets. Nevertheless, these two forces, the pandemic and the oil price war did cause slow growth and impacted Islamic finance. Due to COVID, we found that various institutions, including government institutions, central banks, and banks themselves, introduced several relief measures to, to weather the negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Central banks, like in Saudi Arabia, issued several relief packages for small to medium enterprises of approximately 14 billion US dollars. The Bahrain Central Bank did the similar thing. And we find other, instit other institutions like banks also instituting and extending relief packages to their clients, including small to medium enterprises. This was a welcome move. And we found that several institutions, including the IOFI board based in Bahrain and the Islamic Development Bank had instituted several projects and measures to weather the impact of COVID-19. The Islamic Development Bank issued a res respond, restore and restart initiative in terms of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. We do see that investment in the Islamic economy decreased by approximately 50% in 2020 to 4.9 billion US dollars from a previous high of just over $10 billion. We do, however, note that in 2021, we would see a dramatic increase in Islamic investments into the halal economy. In saying that, we do see three huge opportunities for Islamic finance post the COVID-19 pandemic. The first is in terms of institutionalizing sukuk 
and other innovative Sharia compliance structures. We find that with Sukuk and Islamic bonds, this presents a huge opportunity for countries, sovereigns, and corporates to raise capital from the Islamic capital markets globally. And by democratizing Sukuk, we would see a huge opportunity in terms of decreasing the cost, creating standardization and standardizing the Sukuk market. Secondly, in terms of the harmonization and regulation of Islamic financial standards, the industry is now at a mature phase where we could develop a one rule book or standardize or standardized models for Islamic finance globally. Already the United Arab Emirates in a partnership with the Dubai Islamic Economic Development Center and Norton Rose have initiated a special project to standardize Islamic finance standards in the UAE. This is indeed a very welcomed initiative and we hope to see many such initiatives being pursued, especially at a governmental level, so that we can have standardization of the Islamic economy globally. Thirdly, is major institutions, including the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, have advised that Islamic social finance in instruments like zakat, sadaqa, waqf, etc., could have a huge impact in terms of minimizing the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We find that the zakat sector is worth approximately $100 billion globally, and this could definitely be increased. And with the advent of FinTech, there could be much more initiatives in terms of the proper and sustainable development of the zakat sector. Like that, there are various other social fi Islamic social financial instruments that could be used to minimize the impact of COVID-19. There is also a huge opportunity in terms of targeting the high net worth market for Islamic finance and approximately the global wealth of Middle Eastern investors had dropped to close to 9% due to the COVID-19 pandemic. They are becoming much more aware of Islamic finance and Islamic financial instruments and hence an opportunity for fintechs, Islamic investment platforms, technology platforms to make use of this opportunity to provide suitable Sharia compliant investments to high net worth individuals. And we find institutions like HSBC, etc., seeking to use this opportunity to target this segment of the market. With that, we have now covered the first two sections of my discourse, that is in terms of the Islamic finance industry in 2020 and the impact of COVID-19 on the Islamic financial industry. With that, the last segment of today's discussion will entail a brief discussion around the outlook for Islamic finance in 2021 and the opportunities for Islamic finance going forward. There is obviously a huge opportunity in the growth story of Islamic finance. And I would like to outline five key opportunities or five key pillars for the potential growth of Islamic finance. The first is in, in terms of FinTech, Islamic FinTech and the development of disruptive technologies that would advance the cause of Islamic finance. We all know the huge impact that COVID has had on, on the poor and the impoverished. And perhaps by the usage of FinTech and disruptive technologies, we could see an enhanced democratization of Islamic finance through the use of FinTech. And when we talk of FinTech, we talk of all the different segments of fintech disruptive technologies, including decentralized finance or DeFi, including the usage of blockchain, including the usage 
of super applications and application technology so that we can advance the cause of Islamic finance. And I would like to provide two examples in terms of Islamic fintech. The first is in terms of the usage of AI technology and machine learning to conduct Sharia audits that would then be able to provide greater transparency for the industry globally. And perhaps if we linked these technologies and platforms to a global rule book on Islamic finance, perhaps through the IOFI standards, for example, then clients, stakeholders would be able to get immediate transparency on the Sharia compliance of any Islamic financial institutions. Secondly, in terms of having a blockchain or smart contracts that are backed by blockchain so that the different legs of a Sharia compliant transaction can be approved by a public blockchain system. And an, a good usage of this or a good case study of this would be in terms of an Islamic trade finance or Murabaha transaction. So we know that there are six different stages of an Islamic Murabaha or Sharia compliant Murabaha trade finance transaction. And all of the stages need to be followed based on a fixed and specific procedure. If any one stage is incorrect or is not concluded appropriately, then the transaction will be, will be rendered facid and, vo and voidable. So hence, if the usage of smart contracts would be used with, with blockchain technology, then all of the stakeholders would immediately be notified when a transaction takes place in terms of the different stages so that the entire transaction is then approved as being Sharia compliant. This perhaps could either be through a bo public blockchain system or it could e either be through a hybrid uh, blockchain system through the means of Ethereum technology or Dragon Chain or Hyperledger, one of these blockchain technologies or smart contracts that could be used to then enhance Islamic financial contracts. The second pillar for growth for the growth in Islamic finance is regulation and standardization. I have already alluded to this and I would like to mention a few points regarding this. Standardization and creating harmonization of Sharia standards is critical for the sustainable growth of Islamic finance. We do understand that there will always be fiqhi and jurisprudential differences of opinion, but there should be standardization so that we remove the obscurity and confusion that Sharia products may or may not pose to consumers of such products. And we are already seeing the UAE leading this discourse in terms of having proper standards for Islamic finance. The third important pillar is in terms of Sukuk and the democratization of Sukuk. Currently, Sukuk is seen as a tool or an instrument that is only used by major conglomerates, corporates and sovereigns. But there is no democratization of Sukuk for small to medium enterprises and corporates. And if we democratized Sukuk and the documentation, then it would be easier for institutions to democratize Sukuk. Would that in terms of Sukuk, we could have a lender of last resort and develop an, a secondary and active capital market. And perhaps with the usage of FinTech, we would be able to then democratize Sukuk to a much greater extent. The next pillar is in terms of the harmonization and development of a global halal ecosystem. And perhaps this has been the dream of many practitioners in Islamic finance or the halal economy. And there are various subsectors or industries within the halal economy and that includes halal pharmaceuticals, halal media, halal food and beverage, etc. And if we then standardized and created the harmony and an intersection between all of these different aspects of the halal economy, then that would perhaps create 
a very strong precedent for inter-trade development and growth within Muslim-dominated countries and for the global Muslim ummah and population. And lastly, there is a huge opportunity in terms of Islamic venture capital. And we know that venture capital recently in the news has been in the limelight in terms of certain global funds like the SoftBank, Vision Fund, etc. And if we developed our own Islamic venture capital funds and invested into technology, artificial intelligence, fintech, etc., this would create a huge impact in terms of the growth for the Islamic economy. And unfortunately, if we look at a simple exercise of how many patents have been registered in Muslim countries or Muslim majority countries, that is very, very minimal and low compared to Western countries. And we need to promote the development and innovation within Muslim countries. And if we developed Islamic venture capital funds and promoted such venture capital investment, then inshallah, we could see huge development in this sector also. With that, I would like to terminate this brief discourse with a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And this brings us to the main vision and mission that we have been promoting at Taif Digital Institute in terms of the promotion and awareness of Islamic finance. In one hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, طَلَبُ كَسْبِ الْحَلَالِ فَرِيدَةٌ بَعْدَ الْفَرِيدَةٌ that to seek a halal and sharia compliant income is an obligation after an obligation. So just as it is fard for us to perform salah, it is also equally important for us to ensure that our financial dealings are sharia compliant. And when we talk of Islamic finance, we are not only talking about how you finance your vehicle, your home, etc. We are talking of every single aspect of your financial dealings. And this relates to the broader topic of the Islamic economy about how you conduct your financial affairs, including how you earn your income and whether your income is also Sharia compliant. So with that, I would like to, to terminate and conclude my discourse for today. And I would like to now open the field for question and answers. And I now hand over to our respected brother from the Taif Digital Institute of Islamic Finance. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala rasulil kareem. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheikh, for uh, for a beautiful session and uh, informative session. Uh, I would like Mr. Zia, uh, our CEO of Taif Digital Institute, Islamic Finance, uh, to take up the questions uh, from the people. Anybody who have any questions, you can type your questions in Q&A or perhaps you can raise your hands and we can ask the questions from you. Sheikh, there is a question in a Q&A tab, uh, as you can see. Uh, Muhammad Anisullah Haq have asked this question. So, so the question is, what are the opportunities for legal professionals in the Islamic finance sector? And how can the Islamic finance sector develop in the legal arena? Very good question from our respected brother. And I would like to answer this in two, in, two, in two phases. The first is the primary basis for the Islamic economy and Islamic finance is based on contractual obligations. So obviously there would be a huge demand and opportunity for Islamic legal professionals who would be able to advise on contractual obligations in the Islamic finance sector. And in saying that, there are perhaps two opportunities. The first is in terms of the creation 
of suitable technologies, fintech, that would be able to provide unique services from a legal perspective to the Islamic finance industry. And this perhaps lends to what I previously mentioned in terms of the harmonization and standardization of Islamic contracts and Islamic documentation for the halal economy. Secondly, is that in terms of the legal field and Islamic finance, there could be suitable documentation that is then developed by legal professionals to serve as templates for innovative Sharia compliant solutions. And there are various global law firms that have developed such documentation in the past, and there is a huge opportunity for further development in that sphere. So with that, I would like to advise that the Islamic finance sector requires assistance and advice from the legal fraternity in terms of development of suitable legal documentation around Islamic finance. And lastly, is that the legal profession can also assist with the suitable development of regulations and laws and guidelines for governmental institutions like central banks, etc., in terms of developing suitable laws to enhance and enable Islamic finance. This is where I feel there is a huge demand. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zia. Would you like to take a few questions? No, no. I was just thanking Sheikh for thank you, Sheikh. the nice presentation. And like, yeah, there is the next question. There is uh, from Brother uh, Mustafa Umakhir. I think I have pronounced him correctly. Is what is the impact of COVID on contracts for participation? So this is a very good question. Uh, in terms of the impact of COVID on contracts for participation, where essentially it is contracts based on Musharaka, Mudaraba, where there is an equity participation. So there is a huge impact on these contracts because obviously the returns or the profitability of these contracts depend on the actual business being conducted that underpins such contractual arrangements. So due to covid and the subsequent oil price war in the Middle East and the lockdown measures that were undertook, that were undertaken globally, we had viewed and understood the huge impact of COVID-19, especially on small to medium enterprises. However, the industry as a whole has a very small percentage invested in participation contracts and the perhaps the biggest impact would have been on the equity markets in terms of Islamic equity funds etc. However we have seen that the Islamic equity markets have in actual fact overperformed and in many instances they have overperformed previous benchmarks. So the majority of the impact on participation contracts, especially Islamic equity funds, uh, has been very minimal. In terms of act actual Musharaka and Mudaraba contracts, as I've mentioned, very minimal because a very small percentage of such assets are invested in such contracts. However, because the industry also has invested heavily into the property sector, um, this has, has also impacted on the profitability. So I would agree that there is an impact in terms of profitability but not in terms of huge losses that we foresee. Thank, thank you very much, Sheikh. Sheikh, uh, there is a question from Abdullahi Ali. Uh, brother is saying that Islamic venture capital funds are very small in Muslim countries compared to Western countries. What are the challenges of getting establishing venture capital companies in Muslim countries? So this is indeed a very good question and something which 
is very close to my heart in terms of Islamic venture capital. So perhaps the biggest challenge with regards to Islamic venture capital is in terms of, in terms of the mindset. So from a mindset perspective, we see that the mindset in Muslim majority countries is primarily to invest in hard and fixed assets, and they have not been exposed to venture capital per se. So in saying that, perhaps the greatest opportunity is to then educate, create awareness, and also for the government to promote venture capital so that there can be further in, uh, foreign direct investment, FDI, and development of human capital in disruptive technologies uh, and the fourth industrial revolution. So we as Muslims, we should be forward thinking, we should innovate, and we should aim to reach the greatest heights in terms of innovation and future development of, of the Ummah. So from that perspective, we can take a leaf out of the West in terms of learning from them, in terms of how they have advanced, in terms of developing technologies and innovation when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution. So the, perhaps the, the biggest challenge, as I mentioned, is in terms of the mindset. Secondly, is in terms of enabling the right standards and promotion from governmental agencies for venture capital. So there should be some form of promotion, some form of, some form of support from governmental agencies and support institutions for venture capital. Thirdly, is that Islamic financial institutions should, alloc should make allocations for venture capital and venture capital funding. We find that in the West, you have major institutions like Sequoia Capital, you have uh, SoftBank, etc., that have major participation from institutions, from banks, from governments, from pension funds. But why is it that Islamic pension funds, pension funds in Muslim-dominated countries do not invest in venture capital? So we need to change the mindset in terms of making allocations from an institutional level to venture capital companies and firms. MashaAllah, Sheikh. I, I believe that Brother uh, Abdullahi Ali is satisfied with the answer. There is a question from Hassan Hassan uh, from a student perspective, or I must say from an upcoming leader perspective, because all the students in the industry are upcoming leaders of the finance industry. He's saying, what are the contemporary and the most debatable issues and topics discussed in Fikul Mamlat that the Islamic finance student must be aware? Very good question, especially from a potential Islamic finance leader, inshallah. So in terms of the contemporary and debated issues in Fiqh al perhaps some of the fundamental issues include the rate of return, including the coupon and the calculation rate in terms of a suku coupon and how that is calculated, whether it could be a fixed coupon or a floating rate coupon, uh, etc. Um, this is one of the issues. The second issue is in terms of the usage of intellectual property for securitization, especially in terms of sukuk. Thirdly, is in terms of the usage of tawarruq, bayul ina, and, and other similar concepts that have only been permitted in the case of umumul balwa and haja in terms of personal need and general requirement from, from the society at large. Um, also, the usage of certain nadir and shah's views or weak views in different madahib and different schools of thought that are then applied to various financial transactions. For example, a shah's view that appears in the Hanbali madhab, can it, be, can it then be applied in a situation where the majority of the customers of an institution are of the Hanafi madhab? So these are certain contemporary and fiqh issues that we should give consideration to, and there needs to be much more research around this. However, there have been much discussion and there are various kutub uh, or academic books uh, documented in the Arabic language by various ulama and scholars from the Arab world and non-Arab world 
uh, from the Muslim world in terms of um, opinions and discussions around contemporary topic, topics of Islamic finance, etc. Um, so, so these these issues have been covered broadly in the Arabic language. However, there needs to be much more translation of such uh, books from Arabic into English for broader participation. So therefore, from a fiqhi perspective, there is much, much research to be done in terms of reviewing contracts, and also potentially in terms of innovation, where suitable innovations can then be executed to enhance the industry further. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was, I was expecting a lot of people to ask questions uh, in the dimension of COVID uh, or post-COVID, <clears throat> but the questions are very diverse, uh, as Sheikh can see. There is another question, Sheikh, uh, from Ahmed Patel, and uh, the brother is actually asking on uh, the global assurance. Are there any global assurance providers that certify Sharia compliance to financial investments products? Currently, we rely on appointed Sharia board and individual board members. Uh, Sheikh, I, I, I want you to address this question, please. This is, a, this is indeed a very good question. And unfortunately, there has been the supposition that Sharia boards have basically been marking their own homework for far too long. And we need to have external assurance providers from a Sharia perspective to review the transactions of any financial institution from a Sharia compliance perspective. And obviously, this boils down to two issues. The first is in, two, in terms of uh, institutionalization, harmonization, and standardization uh, of Islamic financial standards. And if you look at models like uh, Malaysia, where the central bank reg regulates Islamic finance, and Sharia board members need to report their transactions to the central bank of Malaysia or Bank Negara Malaysia, or in the case of the UAE, where there is a higher Sharia authority that reviews all of the transactions uh, and there has to be reporting in terms of financial transactions, Islamic financial transactions to the UAE Central Bank. Um, so this is the first point. Secondly is in Bahrain, it has been made mandatory for audit uh, uh, and accounting uh, institutions uh, and for financial institutions to report to such audit and accounting firms from a from an Islamic financial perspective. So there is uh, a regulatory external Sharia audit that is conducted. So perhaps these are some uh, these are some uh, you know measures that could be introduced to ensure that there is transparency, uh, that there is uh, standardization, and there is adequate reporting and auditing in terms of Islamic financial institutions. Obviously, the, the key issue always remains in terms of the uh, conflict of interest perspective, uh, where Sharia board members are being remunerated by the financial institutions that seek fatawa and seek Islamic legal, legal edicts from, from, from the same Sharia board members that they also pay them and, and, and remunerate them. This is a major issue and we feel that inshallah in the future that there could be certain models where the central bank appoints uh, the Sharia board members and pay them to conduct their duty in terms of uh, supervising and regulating all Islamic financial institutions and funds. This also bodes well for, for banks and funds because there is greater transparency and clients and consumers of such products will be 100% confident to know that there is proper guidance, that there is proper transparency and standardization uh, in terms of Sharia audit and Sharia audit mechanisms. Currently, we have Sharia audits that are majority conducted by the same Sharia board members that have issued fatwas uh, to allow for such transactions. So this is a case clearly of a clear conflict of interest where the Sharia board members are basically marking their own homework. So from that perspective, it is a huge challenge and we invite participants from the industry, from outside the industry to provide their suggestions and to push towards an agenda of further transparency within this space. MashaAllah, Sheikh. I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, with the knowledge <coughs> that you have, uh, people are really, really benefiting from this. Uh, I, I see there are two hand raised. I would like 
Yeah, uh, before you move there, yeah, Hassan, before you move there, thank you very much, Sheikh. Very uh, informative speech and very informative uh, answers to the questions. I have two questions. In fact, like if uh, I would request you kindly to summarize what do you see like post COVID uh, opportunities for Islamic finance, like in few sentences, how would you summarize going forward? What is the opportunity for Islamic finance and any specific uh, professions like because majority of the people who attend our webinars and who are uh, who come to Taif are uh, young, young students or young professionals. So any specific. So what do you see? Like, how do you summarize the opportunities going forward? How do you see post COVID 2021? for Islamic finance uh, and what are the profession that you recommend uh, specifically in Islamic finance to the youth that they should pursue? Very good question. Perhaps the three greatest opportunities post COVID, firstly is in terms of FinTech. From a, from, a, from, a, from a FinTech perspective, huge opportunity for students, for entrepreneurs to develop Sharia compliant fintech institutions so they can take advantage of this global movement towards the fourth industrial revolution and obviously the pandemics has sped this up and we find that there have been instances of um, you know platforms like Robinhood, reddit etc where these could be fundamental changes in terms of forcing change and transparency for the islamic finance industry for far too long we have we have we have relied upon the establishment for Islamic financial products. We now need to look at a more democratized and transparent manner of issuing such products at a global scale in a manner that appeals to, to, to the generation Z, to the millennial generation, and in terms of further enhancing the innovation and sust sustainability of the Islamic finance industry. So I would say FinTech and all of its subsidiaries, uh, including AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, smart contracts, etc. Huge opportunity there for students to basically, uh, you know, put their, their knowledge of technology, place their knowledge of technology together with Islamic finance and create these platforms and opportunities and suitable financial products based, on, based on, on the premise of FinTech. That's the first opportunity. The second opportunity is in terms of, um, is in terms of Islamic venture capital funding. Uh, huge opportunity there. We haven't seen any Islamic venture capital funds. And perhaps an opportunity is for students and, and, and entrepreneurs to partner with other normal conventional venture capital funds and develop Sharia compliant models with them. And we are happy to assist them also in terms of developing such standards, in terms of you know having partnerships and JVs, joint venture agreements with normal venture capital funds. Imagine if we could have a Sharia compliant soft bank vision fund, uh, or we could have a Sharia compliant Sequoia capital uh, venture capital fund in association with an Islamic bank or an Islamic institution. This could be phenomenal in terms of enhancing uh, you know the development and growth of Islamic finance globally. Thirdly is in terms of the uh, you know, harmonization and sustainability and development of, of the halal economy as a whole. So not only looking at it from an Islamic finance perspective, but trying to link Islamic finance with the other subsectors of the halal economy, including Isla halal pharmaceuticals, halal food, uh, etc. So how, how we can link these, all of these different sectors to create a unified platform. So for example, we, we recently heard of the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement that formed a joint block for the African continent. And did you know that 42% of the population of the African continent are Muslim? Now imagine if you had access to 1.2 billion uh, you know, people on the African continent, continent and 43% of them were Muslim. In other words, uh, close to 500 million people as a training block could be able to use 
uh, you know, global platforms that will provide opportunities, uh, trading opportunities, opportunities, financial products, uh, halal pharmaceuticals uh, in terms of a global platform to 500 million, Mus million Muslims only in Africa. Like that, there are various other opportunities. So we need to start thinking at that level in terms of enhancing and advancing uh, the cause of, of Islamic finance. And remember that what greater pleasure can there be where one can earn their income in a Sharia compliant manner while also promoting Sharia compliance and also promoting Islamic finance. So one is you can earn a halal income and secondly also is you can leave a legacy behind. Uh, and uh, I'm so happy and so proud, feel proud that like uh, these three areas that Sheikh has identified, uh, we at Taif are addressing all the three, uh, one very directly and two indirectly. The one area which uh, Sheikh has identified as fintech, uh, we have a, 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 new, a new course that is coming soon. Uh, which is on fintech and it is one of inshallah in terms of uh, the content it will be one of the most comprehensive uh, uh, courses on fintech that will cover uh, the general concepts and theory and uh, practical aspects of fintech and uh, and the islamic uh, side of the fintech as well and sheikh himself is planning to do a course very soon on uh, Islamic investments and related uh, areas. And uh, inshallah, this Islamic venture capital related opportunity and um, uh, related uh, topics, hopefully inshallah, Sheikh will also cover in his, uh, in his course. And the third one that Sheikh identified as harmonization and standardization <clears throat> in that area as well. We are working, the TAIF is working on uh, courses on uh, Islam, IUF standards and other standards that are applicable and even like uh, corporate governance that is required and uh, opportunities in the corporate governance. So, Alhamdulillah, we are aligned um, under the guidance of uh, Sheikh uh, Ismail Desai and uh, other Sheikh that we have on our panel. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, we are uh, preparing the youth for and targeting, prepare the young youth uh, for uh, Islamic finance, to offer Islamic finance as an alternative to what the world is <clears throat> facing today. And inshallah, as Sheikh has identified, we see it as a great opportunity for uh, all. Uh, I see like uh, one hand... Uh, Brother Laval Amino Bala raised. I would appreciate if it is a question. I would appreciate if you can type it. Or, uh, Esan, normally, how do you proceed like this? Yeah, we, we can ask, uh, ask ask if this a uh, question, short one, because we are running out of time. I will ask him quickly uh, to ask the question. Michelle. Sure. Should Brother I... Lawala, you can unmute yourself uh, and you can ask the question. Are you there, Brother Laval? All right. Uh, no, I, be I believe... Uh, uh, yeah. I think... Uh, I think... Uh, let's... Uh, let's uh, conclude uh, here. Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, like, uh, thank you very much again, Sheikh, for your time. And uh, so, as usual, enlightening, uh, like all of us, every time we interact with you, we have you on our panel, uh, we really end up learning a lot of uh, new things from you. Jazakallah khair for all your support and for all your guidance. Uh, that you give to us uh, offline in terms of uh, Taif Digital Institute. We really thank you. And all of you also, all the participants and attendees who attended uh, the webinar for today, thank you very much for your time. And before I conclude, I would like to highlight to you uh, two, uh, 
uh, one course that is going on is on risk management is currently going on there is one course in uh, on islamic financial system going on in turkish and there are like a uh, few other courses that are in the pipeline the <clears throat> one which is uh, starting very quickly uh, is uh, on islamic microfinance i have highlighted that uh, you will get more details about uh, sheikh's uh, uh, course uh, very soon inshallah and there is uh, uh, two other courses uh, keep watching the new website for taif is taiflearning.com so taif.ae is also there if you will type taif.ae you will still be routed like this address will take you to taif learning.com and uh, you keep watching the uh, the new courses that are coming there are lots of new courses as i mentioned fintech is one course that is coming and those of you who are interested in pursuing some of the islamic qualifications like sipa or ifq keep watching the website preparatory classes for those two examinations are also coming uh, with this uh, i thank uh, asan and uh, thank you asan for moderating and thank you sheikh once again jazakallah khair <clears throat> thank you very much for your time and thank you very much uh, everybody for uh, attending this webinar uh, this brings this uh, gathering to an end assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh thank you assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh